Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what else is also great to do, at least for the channel? Tell your friends about it. Tell them about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so finally I'm back to doing some wine reviews. Today's wine is a free sample from a new supplier for me. I was approached in June to review this wine. So yeah, I've been sitting on it for a while, but I do have a lot of wines to do at the same time. And that massive education project I told you about, that's taking way more time than anticipated. So I did make an exception to my kind of normal FIFO rule. I bumped this one up to the front. It's the equivalent of, it's the equivalent to do a one tops dinner order falling behind a 23 tops dinner order in a restaurant. Cause it's like 20 some odd wines total I've been doing. Um, but that large party should expect to wait a little bit longer for their food. So I've, I've been the one top. It sucks when you're like, oh, the 20 top got in before me and the kitchen just does it in order. Anyway, this wine is a fairly new project from Farniente. It's called Post and Beam. I'm pretty excited to try it. First, a little background on the winery itself. All right, so back in 1885, the Farniente Winery was founded by John Benson in Oakville, California. It was one of many, many wineries in California that closed due to prohibition in 1919. 60 years later, Gil Nickel bought the property. Now, if that name sounds familiar, he's half of the Nickel and Nickel Winery, which he co-founded with his nephew, Eric Nickel, in 2000. It's also why all the labels and foils look the same. It can be really confusing when you're pulling a wine either out of a restaurant cellar or off of a retail shelf. It took me a while to kind of figure all that out what, you know, what the differences were between the wineries and, you know, being able to tell the difference or being able to notice the difference on those foils. So other wineries that are part of the Farniente uh, family are En Route, Bell Union, and Dolce. All those except Dolce have different branding. So you've got some premium wines going on here. I've had wines from all of these wineries at least once, sometimes multiple times. Other than Dolce, I, I don't think I've ever had that one. And this will be the first time I've had anything from the post and beam uh, side of things. Anyway, so after Gil bought the Farniente property in 1979, he set about renovating the property since it had been disrepair for 60 years. One of the stories on their site is that it was rumored that there was an underground cellar uh, that existed behind a wall. So they blasted through to see what kind of treasure would be there. And unfortunately, there was just more rock. But you know what? That didn't deter them. They went ahead and just built that cellar anyway. All right, so Post and Beam is their newest addition. I wouldn't really call it an entry-level wine since its price is 50 bucks. If anything, this is like a second label of source of the Farniente side of things. Um, their regular Napa Cab retails like $145. In case you're wondering, Nickel Nickel wines are the single vineyard wines. Most of those cabs are around 125 with some retailing for more. All right, so what's behind the story for Post and Beam, the name, right? So the name comes from uh, the style of construction that's used to build many farms in the United States. The idea is that these wines are meant to be, uh, as they put it, a quote, simple, elegant, pure expression of each grape in its finest form. All right, listen, I love a good story uh, as much as the next person. And I know that there needs to be some kind of reasoning here with, with wine. And while that's totally a marketing thing, along with a lot of other stuff on the website, we can hopefully glean something out of this. So my interpretation uh, of the phrase I quoted is to mean that these wines are meant to be more approachable. When looking at the site, they do mention that the Chardonnay does not go through malolactic. That means zero butter. I'm down with that for sure. But that's also kind of their style as a winery with Chardonnay. No mallow for the shards. So my expectation is a smooth, easy to drink, tasty cab that still shows it's from Napa. Nothing over the top. It's, it's hard to call a $50 wine a daily drinker. But given how much their other cabs are, I'd say that's the intent. 
but hey, I haven't even tried the wine yet. And I do know people that that's their daily drinker is 40, 50 bucks. Anyway, before we get into the wine, here are the stats. The 2019 Farniente Post and Beam Cabernet Sauvignon, Napa Valley AVA, it's 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. ABV is 14.5%, is aged 18 months in French oak, 40% are new. All right, so let's get into the wine. I'd heard about this project a few months ago. I've seen the Chardonnay, I've not had it, but I've seen the Chardonnay. And I really wanted to get this one put to the front of the list because I've got a ton of Portuguese and uh, Argentine wines over there to my right to do. So, um, you know that I do a lot of multi-wine sessions. And so this is no, this is no exception. I actually did all the white wines in a rosé. You know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do something real quick. Cause I need to, I need to try this rosé. So, uh, I cut out, I didn't cut out. I, I, I made things go fast real quick. So what happened is I had meant to retry this rosé. Um, yeah, I meant to retry this rosé. Long story short, it didn't show well when I, when I did my recordings. And I had done, this was a wine number 11 of 11 wines, but the other 10 were white wines. So it wasn't like I should have had palate fatigue or anything. And all those other white wines were great. I liked them all. You know, some maybe a little better than others, but I think they're all were they were showed really well. This one didn't show well. Now I just poured that. And once I pour the wine, I don't stop recording. I don't like cut things out because I want to show that it is truly a first impression. So, um, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to put this in, in this, whether I finish all these other wines I got to do tonight or not. Um, I got it. I'm going to try to do this either at the end of the night or the beginning of the next night. Anyway, I'm going to try to get this done and kind of do a future me and see if the wine got better. Maybe I was just not in the right frame of mind that night to do it. Uh, anyway, let's get to this wine. I'll probably record after I do this one. I was actually supposed to record a couple other non-wine non episodes before I recorded this episode, but that's another story. So color-wise, I mean, it's your typical cab. We've got, you know, that really kind of medium plus deep uh, ruby red, a uh, touch of purple in there. Uh, the rim variation, you've, you've got really just, it's just ruby on ruby on ruby and a little bit of purple in there. I'd call it kind of a medium staining on the glass. If we're going to talk tears here. I would, it would they kind of go down pretty quick. I know it's 14.5 on the alcohol, but... Looking at the looking at the uh, tiers, I would think this is close to like a 13 and a half, 14. But sometimes tiers are tiers are really imprecise when it tells you about alcohol and sugar. It's like this kind of gauge, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes the glass just doesn't show tiers really well. Anyway, let's just get into it. So I would call this, you know, medium plus on the aromatics. Definitely youthful. I mean, it should be for, what is this, 19, right? No, 19, yeah. So you've got some really lush fruit, a lot of black fruit in this. So blackberry, black raspberry. You've got some strawberry. You've got some kind of fresh cranberry. You got raspberry for sure. And it's all kind of wrapped in like this fresh tilled earth. You've got this kind of vanilla, you know, oak. You got this vanilla and kind of baking spice thing going on. Touch of cinnamon. I don't even call it a touch of caramel. A little bit of chocolate. Almost like a chocolate caramel like covered, I don't know, fruit. Black fruit. Just just pick any of them. It's like having kind of chocolate and caramel. There's a richness to it. It's a little bit of wood quality. And I don't mean like, you know, I smell the oak barrel, but like a wood, you know, freshly polished wood. Yeah, you get the kind of little cinnamon red hot. 
I can smell the alcohol. There is a little bit of a burn in the nose. So, you know, bottle list 14.5. It can be as low as 14. It can be as high as, I think, 15.5. They've got a one, they've got a 1% leeway above 14%. It's kind of confusing because 14% was the break point for everything, including the taxes, but then they changed the taxes to 16%. But I got to contact the TTB and find out if the alcohol thing also shifted to 16% and higher is a 1% 1, 1 variance and below 16% is 1.5. And you can't cross the line. Like if you have a 14, let's, let's say it's 14% still. If you put 13.5 on the wine label, and you, even though you have a one and a half percent leeway, your wine can't be over 14%. Okay. Similarly, if your wine's listed as 14.5, like this one, and you have the 1% leeway, your wine actually can't go below 14%. You can't be a 13.5% wine. So you have a leeway, but you also have an upper and lower limit, depending on where you're at above the 14 or maybe it's 16. Anyway, there's, there's a good richness to the wine. I mean, it smells like a normal, uh, California Cabernet Sauvignon, I would even so go so far as say it smells like like a typical Napa. If I smell this, like like it's probably my first thought on a blind, like Napa Napa Cab, like or at least New World Cab, but premium. So on the palate, you got all that lush fruit again. You got the red and the black fruits. Turn a little more red for me this time, as far as a primary. More of that raspberry going on. We got that blackberry in there too. You've got that vanilla. You've got a little bit of that uh, chocolate and that caramel going on. It, it's it's more caramel than chocolate, but they're there. Fresh chilled earth. A touch of red flowers. They're kind of dry. The wine the wine's dry. The fruit really starts to kind of lush and ripe, but then the fruit kind of dries out a little bit. A little bit of bramble to this. A little, I wouldn't call it rusticity, but got a little prickliness to it. Like you got some thorns in there or something like that. You definitely have the oak. My mouth's watering a lot. Cab is not normally a high acid wine and I don't have the acid numbers for this, but it, it, my mouth is watering a lot. So they may retain some acid in here. It's also possible they could have acidified uh, the wine to try to add some more freshness to it. Now, a couple episodes ago when I did my Great California Cab Shootout, which this was not part of, I did talk about acidification as being something that can be done. At least I think I did. I haven't recorded that episode yet. Uh, but lots of little things you can do in the winery that that everybody does, okay? This is one of those like open, it's an open secret that wines do get adjusted. There are plenty of wines, and this may be one of them, where they, they do the minimal, just that they make sure everything ferments and they don't really jack with it too much. Um, just they just make sure the fermentation happens and nothing bad happens to the wine and they don't do anything like, they don't make any adjustments. But the acid seems to be kind of high for a cab. It doesn't make, doesn't make it bad. It, just makes it it's still delicious. It was just kind of like, it was kind of threw me off a little bit. And it also is the first wine of the day. So... It may prove to be that it's normal acid for for cab, but it maybe just it just hit me kind of weird. It tastes really good. It tastes exactly the way it should. It tastes to, it tastes in that fifty dollar range of of Napa cab. If you told me it was a forty dollar bottle of one, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I get that. If you told me it's a sixty dollar bottle of one, I'd be like, okay, I get that. Maybe even a little bit more on either end of that of that spectrum. But $50, it seems like it's well-priced. It's got great aroma. It's got a good finish. It's got good length or whatever you want to call it. It's got a good mouthfeel. The tannin is definitely elevated. We're definitely talking a medium plus in the tannin. It's not shy. The cab is like telling you, hey man, I'm cab. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not silky soft Merlot. I'm not Pinot Noir for sure. Though we know of some Pinot Noirs from California that kind of act like cabs or look like them. Not trying to call anyone out. It tastes good. If you see this in you know a retail shop or you want to buy it off the website, off their website, give it a try. I think the acid is a touch high. But again, this could be first this first first wine of the night. So if you hit me a little bit heavy on on the palate, that'd be the only criticism I'd have of it. 
And it's not really a criticism, it's more of an observation that was like, oh, a little bit higher on that. But it still tastes really good. So yeah, we got 50 bucks to, to, to spend on this. Why not give it, give it a try, man? All right, so that's gonna do it for uh, today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends. And until next time, have some cool cat.